Cátedra Alfonso Reyes del Tecnológico de Monterrey presenta a Jason Shogren. Economista ambiental y co-ganador del Premio Nobel de la Paz 2007. Jason Shogren nació en Minneapolis, Minnesota en 1958. Desde joven le interesaban la música y la naturaleza. Aprendió a tocar la guitarra y creó un grupo musical de punk polka llamado Flygpoikerna, que en sueco significa Flyboys. Su viaje hacia la economía empezó en el pueblo de Clockett, Minnesota. Aquí disfrutaba de acampar y pescar en el bosque. Quería trabajar en temas ambientales y decidió que estudiar economía era la mejor opción. Por casi tres décadas ha impartido clases de microeconomía, economía ambiental, economía de los recursos naturales y economía experimental. Ha sido profesor en la Universidad Estatal de los Apalaches, la Universidad Estatal de Iowa, la Universidad de Yale y la Universidad de Wyoming, donde ha dado clase desde 1995 y donde actualmente es Strug Professor de Conservación y Administración de Recursos Naturales y director del Departamento de Economía y Finanzas. Su trabajo es notable porque ha expandido las fronteras de conocimiento de la economía ambiental. Sus hallazgos han contribuido a entender mejor las fuentes, costos y soluciones a los problemas ambientales. Ha sido reconocido por la Association of Environmental and Resources Economists por sus notables contribuciones profesionales y su liderazgo en el ámbito de la economía ambiental. Ha publicado más de 200 artículos en diversas áreas relacionadas con la economía ambiental y los recursos naturales. Ha sido coeditor de Resource and Energy Economics y editor en jefe de la Enciclopedia de Energía, Recursos Naturales y Economía Ambiental, publicada por El Sevier Science. Entre sus libros destacan Introduction to Environmental Economics Environmental Economics in Theory and Practice Protecting Endangered Species in the United States, Biological Needs, Political Realities, Economic Choices, Private Property and the Endangered Species Act, Saving Habitats, Protecting Homes, Bioeconomics of Invasive Species, Integrating Ecology, Economics, Policy and Management, Species at Risk, Using economic incentives to shelter endangered species on private lands. En 1997 fue nombrado asesor económico del presidente Bill Clinton para apoyar a la administración presidencial en su preparación para el debate del Protocolo de Kioto. Una década después fungió como economista del rey en Suecia. En 2007, obtuvo el Premio Nobel de la Paz junto con el Equipo Intergubernamental de Expertos sobre el Cambio Climático por su investigación que establecía una relación entre la actividad humana y el calentamiento global. Shogren ha expresado, Como economista me preocupa la eficiencia. Como político me preocupan las transiciones. Administrar las transiciones es lo que se requiere con el cambio climático. Nos estamos replanteando la forma en que nos enriquecimos. Nos estamos replanteando pasar de una economía basada en combustibles fósiles a algo muy diferente, incierto y más aventurado. Shogren busca constantemente entender al ser humano. Sabe que, contrario a lo que se cree, los seres humanos no están motivados únicamente por una racionalidad económica. Con miras a encontrar otro tipo de respuestas a la pregunta sobre cómo pueden coexistir el ser humano y la naturaleza, se ha sumergido en actividades como leer poesía, leer a Shakespeare, componer música y tocar con su grupo Jay Shogren Shanghai. Bienvenido al Tecnológico de Monterrey, Jason Shogren. Thank you very much for coming out today, and and thank you very much for Cathedra Alfonso Reyes and Professor Anlora Santa Maria for having me, and thank you again for coming out. I'm going to talk today about what I've done in terms of trying to understand the difference between and the exchanges between economic development 
and environmental conservation and in particular we'll talk about who pays for climate change which probably is our most challenging issue around the globe today in terms of understanding the trade-offs and the challenges and the opportunities between developing an economy and protecting the natural environment that helps us live in the economy that we that we love. Uh, what's happening right now is about a year ago the US and Mexico and Canada agreed that we would get together sometime in the next year and we would try to work together as uh, North Americans and come up with a strategy in order to figure out how to develop a low carbon economy when uh, I know your economy depends a lot on fossil fuels and so does our economy and so does Canada. We're all in the same boat in that uh, we've fostered our economic growth using uh, energy sources that contribute to climate change. I come from the state of Wyoming now, and if you've ever been to Wyoming, you might not know it. If you know Yellowstone National Park and grizzly bears and wolves and all that sort of stuff, that's where I come from. We have um, less than half a million people in the whole state, so it's a very small place. And when I grew up, I grew up in a town in northern Minnesota of 800 people, so I come from a small place. So I'm kind of a small town guy in a big town world trying to understand these trade-offs that go on in our world. And just last month, the energy ministers got together again and signed a memorandum of, agree of understanding in which, again, the three countries are going to promote low carbon electricity, clean energy, energy efficiency, carbon capture, carbon use, adaptation, and thinking about how to reduce emissions from oil and gas sector. Now, a memorandum of understanding is a long way from binding regu regulation, but it's a recognition and a comprehension of the job that lays ahead of us as we think about thinking about climate change. So, if we step back from the politics, what I would like to focus on today is what I do, which is think about the underlying economic issues. So, economics, uh, we have a very particular way of thinking about economics. It's not business, it's not commerce, it's not finance. It's about balancing monetary goals with non-monetary goals. So when I talk about economics, I'm thinking almost more as an applied philosopher than I am as a business person, right? I'm thinking about making trade-offs between the ability to grow financial wealth versus our ability to grow and maintain natural wealth. So I'm thinking about a broader perspective. So I'm going to give you my perspective. Over the last 30 years, I've been doing this and how it frames the decisions I make and it frames the policy options that I'm asked to evaluate for decision makers, policy makers, whether it was inside the White House or whether it's in the state government or whether it's in our local city of uh, Laramie, which I live in now. And uh, all these color my world. It colors my world because as an economist, my job is not to advocate for any one position, but to help a policymaker understand the trade-offs between many positions. And my job isn't to say, you should do X. My job is to say, here's X, Y, and Z. And here are the trade-offs between X, Y, and Z. Now, you were the one who was elected. You get to make the decision and um, take it from there. And we'll talk about the key principles at work in climate economics. So if I'm going to define economics, it's the ability to create value through trade, which is why 
Um, 99% of all economists are typically for free trade and why we think about free trade and NAFTA and all the trade agreements as being generally a good idea to be able to open up markets. In our case, when we think about climate change, we're thinking about a market failure in which we have a global public good in which temperatures around the globe and changes in weather patterns, um, nobody is immune and everyone who makes a contribution in terms of reducing emissions makes that contribution to everyone on the planet and nobody gets compensated for that. So in our minds this is the biggest global coordination game the world is facing right now. So if you think about a coordination game, if you've seen the movie, have you seen the movie A Beautiful Mind about John Nash? So if you've seen that movie, John Nash won the Nobel Prize in Economics for coming up with different equilibrium concepts. Well, go global coordination game is when you have multiple potential outcomes and all of them are equilibria. And the idea is to be able to move out of a low equilibrium to a higher equilibrium. But that re would require us all to coordinate our actions nearly simultaneously. So if I said everybody stand up, see, we couldn't even do it right there, right? So think about trying to do it for climate change when you've got 7 billion people, 200 countries, all with divergent interests. And essentially, we're asking everyone at the same time around the planet to take a step backwards from fossil fuels, even though fossil fuels are what made us rich, right? Or may put money in the bank and put a roof over our heads. And so the whole process of meeting climate change is to figure out what kind of mechanisms we can use, what kind of institutions we can develop, how do we actually coordinate our actions so that without really even saying much, we all take a step backwards in terms of our use of fossil fuels. It's not easy. It's a huge problem. One of the great economists who developed these theories, Thomas Schelling, um, actually developed these theories for the Cold War and started thinking about how does the Western Bloc, the U.S. and Europe, avoid um, a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Right? There are many equilibria there, including all-out destruction versus no launching of nuclear missiles. And that same sort of ideas and the same sort of coordination games are what we're thinking about now in terms of trying to develop self-enforcing agreements for climate change in which nobody's national sovereignty is impugned and that everyone finds it in their own best interest, each nation in the world finds it in their own best interest to be able to take a step back from high carbon energy sources or high carbon production methods. But again, it requires everybody to do it. Now, if you're like, well, um, I come from Scandinavian descent. Uh, my wife is Swedish. And so she's constantly saying, well, but the Swedes always just do it by themselves. They just lead the way. And I said, that's great, but there's only 9 million Swedes, right? And they can only make so much of a difference with them leading the way all by themselves. We still have 7 billion people they have to convince to follow them, right? So... This idea of coming up with self-enforcing agreements is a way to make a structure, an institutional structure, so that this side of the room agrees, the middle side agrees, this side of the room agrees, and we all do it at the same time. So from my perspective, as an economist, I'm a claim, climate agnostic, right? I take the science as given. I don't challenge the natural scientists because I'm not a climatologist. I can challenge their approaches. I can challenge maybe how they do their statistics. I can challenge some of their thinking and some of their logic, but I don't challenge the notion that there is some probability that this is man-made 
which now they've assigned about nine out of 10 chances that this issue, uh, that humans are contributing to it. Instead, I'm pushing for this advocate of efficiency in which what we're trying to provide is more protection, not so much for us actually, but for your kids and their kids, because this is when the real issues are gonna emerge, right? So we're talking about providing more protection for our children, our children's children, and so on down the line at less cost. And we're thinking about trying to measure market benefits, all the things that bring us financial wealth and all the non-market benefits like ecosystem services and human health and uh, reduced air pollution, reduced water pollution, all the issues that are associated with everything that we sort of take for granted because we treat a lot of the environment as a free good. And the way I try to frame it for policymakers is to think of any efforts that we're doing as planet insurance, right, as, a, as an investment. So if you're going to drive your car, chances are you're going to buy insurance because the government makes you or because it makes sense because I know you're a better driver than everybody in here, but there could be somebody who's not so good who hits you and you just have insurance just in case. And that is exactly how we think about it. I mean, we think about how big a risk of, say, something like an increase in three degrees centigrade or maybe four to five degrees centigrade. How big a risk are we willing to take and how much insurance are we willing to set aside for a rainy day if it indeed comes, right? And so for me, this is, you know, just like a, like a physician, uh, you know, cutting open someone's heart, you know. It's a heart, huh? How do I fix it or how do I think about it? Not, not, I don't think how many times it's been broken. I don't think about, you know, how many poems a person has read and how that's influenced their heart. I just look at it and try to give advice about how we would think about it. So this is my perspective that I've worked with over the last 30 years. And so when we think about it, typically, what did I just do? I did something. Um, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, no one ever accused me of being a technological wizard. Um, I think about it from the perspective economists, which are markets. And we, that's our main organizing principle. Just like um, any religion, we have an organizing principle, and ours is markets. Right? And the idea that the markets absorbs all this information, all your demands, all your supplies, and sends back this pure signal to you, which is a price. And as long as nobody gets in the way and doesn't corrupt the price, that price is informative, and that price helps us allocate resources. That's the science of economics. I spend most of my life in missing markets as environmental economists hanging out with ecologists talking about, ah, well, we're missing a market for clean air. We're missing a market for clean water. We're missing a market for biodiversity. And can we create one? And this whole idea of cap and trade, like Santiago did in Chile when they had an air pollution problem. They formed a cap over how much pollution they would allow in the Santiago airshed. And then they traded pollution permits in, in, as a way to reduce air pollution cost effectively. So that's how economists think about an environmental problem. Unfortunately, we spend a lot of time with people where markets are not even in their mindset, right? Is how many have markets as their organizing principle of life? Nobody. So I'm spending a whole room with all you people down here in the bottom cell, right? Who do not organize how they run their daily life by whether or not there's a market or there's missing markets. And so by being in this world, what we're trying to do is pull in different perspectives and different frameworks in trying to give advice to policymakers who have to blend all these things together. Uh, there's nothing wrong with no markets. As you saw, you know, I, I do like to play music. And clearly there is no market for music anymore. You just make it and give it away to everybody in the world. And that's just how it works. What's the economic challenge? <clears throat> Pardon me. 
Uh, we have a long time horizon we have to think about. Uh, as we think about GDP and carbon intensity, it gets a little more uncertain as we move into the future. The link between damages and emissions are uncertain over the long run. We're not 100% sure where it's going to get warmer, colder. We know on average what is going to happen, but on average, you know, that's the old story of your head in the refrigerator and your feet in the oven, and on average you're fine, right? Your head and feet might not agree. So trying to figure out climate sensitivity over the long run, how much damage at each temperature, and whether or not we can outsmart ourselves here and adapt quick enough, depending on the change. There was one, I've seen two estimates on this. There was one estimate that said if humans' investment in technology and our technological breakthrough follows the same pace we have for the last hundred years, we will leave 90% of the world's coal in the ground. Okay. So that says, given what we've done in the past, if we can come up with the same kind of technological inventions in the next hundred years, problem solved. Very optimistic view. There's another view that says, we're unlikely to have that same kind of technological invention. So if you took the technological inventions between, say, 19, oh, 1850 and 1950, and you had to live with those versus the inventions, say, between 2000 and 2016, like Facebook and all the apps and your smartphones, which one would you rather live with? Indoor plumbing. I'd go for indoor plumbing. I'd go for uh, some of those very basic washing machines. I would go for the invention of the washing machine. You know, some really basic stuff. My iPhone apps, I could live without. So the question is whether or not we're going to be able to do it or not. So in general, what economists try to advocate efficiency for is ways to overcome poverty. But in terms of specific climate change, we're talking about reducing the risks of climate change cost-effectively so that frees up more resources for education, for research into pandemics, for research into healthcare. So when I first got involved in this at a policy level was in 97, uh, during the Clinton administration in the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol was one of the first attempts at a binding agreement to deal with climate change. There had been some many talking meetings where we talked about it a lot. But the Kyoto Protocol was an idea of a top-down approach in which we pick the main players in terms of the industrial world and convince them to make some deep cuts. So when I say narrow, we're taking like 55 countries in the world and asking them to make deep cuts. And the big debate inside the administration at that time was whether we should go narrow and deep or whether we should go broad and shallow and try to get everyone in the world involved and ask everyone to do a little. So you can think about it in your own minds. What do you think is a more effective way to get something done to, in your own group, in your own family even, whether or not you want to just take a subset of your family and ask them to do a lot or to get your entire family to do a little bit and then you can turn up the heat you know, as, uh, as things progress. Well, that was the big debate because the benefits at the time was essentially we're talking about trying to avoid a catastrophe in which um, we're talking about ocean circulation slowing down and meltings of the ice sheets with the notion that there's an outside chance that there would be a drop in world GDP of 20%. So the Great Recession of 2008, I mean, that would be nothing compared to this. So the hard part about thinking about these problems, and especially climate change, is that they're low probability, high severity events. And people, all of us, don't really do well at low probability high severity events. Um, is there, I don't know this for a fact, is there a national 
lottery, a lotto, that you can buy tickets in Mexico. So that's a perfect example of a tax on the mathematically challenged, right? Because the expected return is negative. The probability is so low and the prize is so high that people disconnect probabilities from severities and they look at the one that either scares them the most or makes them the most happy. In this case, the lotto, you see that big prize and you know so many other people are buying tickets, your probability is going down, but you always think it could be me, right? Wyoming just introduced a, a lotto after many years of us driving to Colorado to buy our lottery tickets. And the, and the, the motto we have, I, w I wish I had here, it's this um, jackalope, which is a rabbit with antlers, you know, the mythical, our mythical jackalope, reaching for a star, but he never gets it, right? It's always out of reach. But what it means in terms of climate change policy is that people have a hard time thinking about major shifts in the planet with small probabilities. So in the White House, when I, Janet Yellen was my boss, she was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. Now she's the head of the Federal Reserve. And the, re the way I finally got her attention after months of trying to get her attention was to tell her that Scandinavia could freeze over. The Gulf Stream could shift. And then she was like, oh, well, then we got to do something. And, and I said, but it's a very small probability. And she said, well, that doesn't matter. We got to do something because now we don't want frozen Swedes. Right? What triggers our brain to get actions in terms of thinking about climate change, something that's so nebulous and something so hard to get our heads wrapped around, is a lot of the reason why you'll see the political rhetoric stress the damages that could potentially happen and not focus in on so much the probabilities that things could happen. Because Thinking about the damages gets people to think about things in a very different way than thinking about the probabilities. The cost of Kyoto is whether or not we're going to allow for things like cap and trade, where we set a global cap on carbon emissions and we allow countries to trade. And here the big fear was the biggest seller at the time for the Kyoto Protocol would be the Russians. The Russians would be the biggest seller of carbon credits if we had a global market. And not that we don't trust the Russians, we were skeptical, right? Because how do you set up an international police force to trade carbon, right? When, well, what if the U.S., I mean, not that you're skeptical about the U.S., but what if the U.S. decided not to participate after we said we would? I mean, who, who's going to come and tell us we were bad children? Right? I mean, there's big countries, big economies. Uh, you've got to be able to come to some agreement that we actually are going to back up what we say. Um, engaging the BRIC countries to participate, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, where the big population centers are in the future, trying to get them. And then adapting new technologies without a price change. And this is what, I know this is the technical university, but this is what separates economists from engineers, where engineers will say, we have all these new technologies, why don't people just buy them? Why don't they use them? We have, we have a whole shelves of new technologies, and economists are always asking, well, at what price? Well, they're expensive, but they work. And we say, but they already have capital. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in. We're just going to leave that by the wayside while we adopt new technologies. And so there's this tension about what do you have to give up to get these new technologies and the notion of different glide paths. So as old technologies become obsolete, we don't replace them with just small changes in them. We replace them with brand new technologies that do something completely different. And that transition, of course, is not always easy when the technologies have some uncertainty associated with them. So then we move up to Cancun, where we actually set a target of trying to keep average global temperatures below 
or at two degrees Celsius, right? Now, this path is going to require some big changes. So we're talking about zero carbon emissions from electricity mid-century. It's hard to fathom. Zero total emissions by the end of the century. A negative in major sectors before the end of the century. And we're talking about can we burn less than half of the hydrocarbon reserves to have a chance at this 2%. These are huge changes around the planet. If this is the target that we've agreed to as a globe through the Conference of Parties, the COP, if this is what we've agreed to, hitting this target is enormous. This is really, really big. So the red line represents the path of status quo, and we can see the year, and we can see GHG, which is greenhouse gases, on the side here. So that's what that acronym is, greenhouse gases. And you can see the blue line is to bring us back to 2% by uh, the end of the century. The green line is some compromise in between. So in terms of pulling down carbon emissions, we have an issue. Because think about this. This is a problem of stock and flow. It's like your bathtub. You fill up your bathtub. That's our stock of carbon. And it takes a molecule of carbon somewhere on the order of 100 years to disappear. And now our emissions are the flow into the bathtub. And so if the bathtub drain is clogged or is slower than what we're filling it up, obviously the bathtub is going to fill up quicker. What the blue line is showing is that the sources of emissions into the bathtub have to be basically shut off by mid-century. This is hard to fathom for most of us who are used to mobility with an automobile or um, me getting here on an airplane or any form of transportation or just being able to turn on your lights. Um, this is not a trivial change. Now there's two generic economic viewpoints depending on what type of economist you are or what you believe as an economist. There's this deliberate econ economics, which we still have time. And then there's the urgent economics, which is what are we waiting for? What are we doing? So let's take a look between the two. So the deliberate viewpoint is that what we need to do is slow down the accumulation of greenhouse gases. So we need to start turning the bathtub spigots to off. I guess that would be this way. But policies to try to turn things down to zero are just premature. We're overreacting. We're going to cause too big a disruption if we try to do it like turning a battleship on a dime. Right? You're just not going to be able to turn a big ship, just flip it without flipping the ship. You know, you got to plan ahead and turn this thing. Uh, we got to think in terms of adaptation. We got to think in terms of changing how we deal with things, which humans are generally pretty good at. And we still have time to create this efficient global governance of climate change. We still have time to figure out a path in which we can all agree to some self-enforcing and voluntary agreement that there's no imposition from any other countries and we all find a path to do it. This is the notion of that we have many glide paths to land the, to a low carbon economy. And these many glide paths can take anywhere between 10, 20, 50, 75 years to transform what we consider now normal life into what we would consider a low carbon life. And that the best strategy is to figure out how to set up institutions so when we retire current capital, we replace it with low energy, low carbon capital, 
and we don't have a rebound effect like when you buy a, a Prius, a hybrid car, before you used to drive 50 kilometers and now you drive 100 kilometers because you get such good gas mileage, right? So as long as there's not a behavioral rebound effect, or not a very big one, then we can think about this glide path. And this is taken by a lot of economists. You might know um, Nordhaus, Mendelssohn, the guys who are, who are doing climate change up in Yale. This is their viewpoint in terms of more deliberate view. The urgent economics is this, what are we waiting for? So this is Sir Nicholas Stern from London School of Economics. And I think if you, you know, if you're dealing with somebody like me who's already an environmental economist and I start talking about climate change, you might say, oh, well, you know, just look at him. He's already kind of a greenie and he's got a big beard and, you know, he hangs out in the woods and he plays music. Why would you ever take him seriously? He worries about, you know. Well, Sir Nicholas Stern is very proper. I mean, he's got Sir in front of his name. He's a very proper British guy, an economist, very... And when he's nervous, then you should be nervous. Right? When I'm nervous, yeah, well, okay. When he's nervous, I'm nervous. Let's put it that way. Because typically he's not an environmental economist. He's not an economist who spends his time doing what I do. But he has essentially given up his career as a macroeconomist and as a... Um, financial economist to focus in the last part of his career on thinking about climate change. And it's a huge transformation and it, it caught a lot of us um, by surprise. We did not expect that. And his arguments are that there's these ratcheting effects in an economy. So by ratcheting effect I mean you're coming along and you essentially hit a springboard that ratchets you up. They're nonlinear shifts in the damages. It's not this smooth damage path where you just like a like a frog in boiling water. Right? It's not just a slow little temperature thing until you're cooked. It's you're going around very smoothly and then all of a sudden you're boiled. Okay? These tipping points are a big concern to him. Techno technological lock-ins are a big concern, which is a technological lock-in is essentially what we are right now in terms of fossil fuels. We are locked into a fossil fuel economy. It brings us wealth. It brings us the things that we want. Moving out of that economy is incredibly hard. As other economies develop, as China begins to become more and more powerful, as India begins to become more and more powerful, as all of Latin America becomes more powerful in terms of their economies, how are they going to do it? And what technologies are they going to lock in to foster that economic growth? And what they're arguing now is based on this notion of nonlinear movements and people getting locked in, even though nature might be moving non-linearly, we are moving linearly because we've been locked in. Um, that puts ourselves at risk and an inability to adapt quick enough. And this notion of transparent ethics, well, you know, economists have no, we have no comparative advantage in ethics. Right? We, we promote trying to make the economic pie big. And then once in a while we argue about, well, maybe some people have too much of the economic pie. And that part on the ethical part is not always our strongest suit. So this is this notion of stocks versus flows and who's responsible for reducing both of these. This brings us to Paris back in December. And what Paris was all about was trying to come up with what we can call pledge and review. And this to me is interesting. I've spent the last decade um, exploring the notion of non-monetary commitment through oaths and vows and pledges, something that's not very economics. But it's very economical to me because 
all economic exchange is about trust. Right? It's all about, do I trust you to deliver the goods? Do we have a contract? What if we're delivering non-market goods? Now, how do we build trust in providing non-market goods? And so I've been studying the history of the oath and the pledge and the vow throughout history to understand how that might be incorporated into environmental policy in a significant way. Now, I was just doing it because I was interested in it, and lo and behold, that's exactly what was happening in Paris and happening around the globe at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. And this idea is that every country is going to pledge to a target and then we're going to review it. Is there any kind of penalties? Well, we could threaten some trade sanction, we could threaten some kind of blockade. I mean, but it really is to get every nation in the world to find something they can commit to and stick to it, right? So intended nationally determined contributions, and this is the common commitment device. So when I talked about that global coordination game, this is the coordination device, this pledge and review, to get everybody to take a step backwards. Now, this is everybody. It's not just a bunch, not just a few, and you can choose how much you want to step backwards right, in terms of a carbon future. Some people can step way back, like Sweden, and again, everybody will say thanks, but that's only 9 million people. But we got to get the US and China and India to all step back. Now we're talking about 50% of the carbon emissions. And if you can't get US and China to step back, and U.S. is not going to step back until China steps back, and China is not going to step back until the U.S. steps back. So we came to an agreement before Paris, the President Obama and the Chinese uh, government to hold hands and agree to step back. Then when we went to Paris, it was much easier for us to say, yes, we've agreed to a pledge because we, we, we have the Chinese firmly in our grip here and they're coming back with us and that to us and the administration all administrations democrat republicans was probably the biggest thing about contributing to climate change policy is um, understanding how to engage the chinese because the way i always tell it to my students so i always usually say to them you know think about this because wyoming's kind of isolated we're up in the mountains, and I say, you know, the Chinese government, the Chinese government could send 300 million people here to give us all and each a hug. We could have 300 million people, and we could all hug our Chinese hugger, and there would still be six to 700 me million people at work back in China. So the whole U.S. could be hugging. And there'd be 700 million people working in China doing something. And so for my, you know, for us Wyoming students, that sort of puts a little light bulb in their head to go, oh, I get it. We're not the center of the world. No, we're not, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, I hate to burst your bubble, but no, it's, it's a big world out there. And then a choice on incentives. Do we want to fix the quantity of carbon by setting a cap and trade system again? Or do we want to fix a price, a carbon tax? Environmentalists love cap and trade because it fixed the quantity and allows all the risk to be in the economy because prices vary. Business loves, they don't love taxes, but if they had to take one, they might take a carbon tax because that fixes the price of the tax and allows the variation to happen in the quantity. Right? And so most economists who think about climate change uh, for their daily living push this notion of a carbon tax rather than a quantity constraint. 
because a quantity constraint implies some form of uh, monitoring around the globe. A carbon tax is just every country can decide what they want to put uh, when they s set up a set up some kind of tax on on carbon. Um, but then again, yeah, introducing a tax is not always the most popular thing in any economic situation. So if we have a global price commitment, we're going to focus on trying to understand how each country will answer the following question. We will price carbon at X dollars per ton if and only if everyone else does so too. Right? So again, it's this coordination game of everyone stepping forward to put up a carbon tax at the same time. Everyone around the, the globe, every plant, every uh, country, every person playing, paying some. And that X up there can't be zero. It has to be something. It can be small. It doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to double the price of gasoline like they do in Norway or in Sweden. You know, it can be smaller. It can be used to motivate people. But the fact is, most green taxes are used to raise revenue for other projects than they are used to change behavior. But ideally, you would want to pick a number in X to change behavior, not just raise revenue for some other project. It provides this focal point. It provides this idea of revenue recycling, where we take that tax money and invest it in low-carbon technologies. It also sets up this green price fund in which money that is contributed from, say, the developed countries gets put into a fund that can help subsidize projects in emerging economies. And it also potentially avoids us discussing geoengineering. Um, do we really want to get to the point where we're shooting particles into the atmosphere? Do we want to go that route? Right? I mean, the economics of geoengineering is incredible. Is that really what we're talking about in terms of adap ad adaptation? By going to that extreme of trying to engineer the planet's atmosphere. Um, that's our, uh, one of our outside options. All right, so if we can't figure out a way to step back from emissions or to step forward with a carbon tax. Um, geoengineering is sort of right outside the door. Just like nuclear power is right outside the door. And in nuclear power, um, it's one of the great untalked abouts in terms of climate change because nobody wants to talk about it. I mean, the French deal with it. Several other countries around the world deal with nuclear power. The Japanese have had their ups and downs with it. And in the U.S., I don't think we've messed around with building anything new for a good three decades now. But both geoengineering and nuclear power are right outside the door as options if we decide that we can't do something ourselves. Everybody's pretty quiet now. Right? So now if you bring in President Obama, we think about this in terms of the pledges. You know, pledge and review, you can also call it naming and shaming, right? Because that's kind of what you're up to. If somebody doesn't hit their target, you can try to, just like in the schoolyard, try to make them feel bad that they didn't hit their target. Um, Article 21, so once they translate the Paris Protocol into all the languages they need to. I think it's uh, six or eight. Starting in April, then people can sign on to it. So right around Earth Day, uh, they're going to introduce the ability to sign on to the protocol, every country, formally. I think it's April 21st. And the idea is they're going to try to get at least 55 countries to sign on immediately so the thing is in place. So the thing is actually takes hold as long as they get 55 countries to sign on. And then everybody else has until 2020 to sign on. 
not that long. I guess it is 2016. It gives you four years to come up with a strategy that you can live with to sign on to it. Domestically in the U.S., um, we have a gridlocked Washington, D.C. with Democratic President, Republican Senate, and Republican House. And most everything that's happening in terms of climate change is coming through the executive office. So President Obama is signing executive orders like the Clean Power Plan, which is to cut greenhouse gas emissions and power stations by a third within 15 years. We've got what are called embedded actions in the states. So every state has a plan, California leading the way. Um, Wyoming doesn't have a plan. I guess that's not surprising, given we are a fossil fuel colony for the rest of the United States. We have more coal. We've got enough coal to run the U.S. economy for three to 400 years ourselves. So we're a little upset with this idea that we're going off fossil fuels because we don't have much else besides, you know, me and 400 other thousand people trying to figure out what they're going to do. Right? So we're not so thrilled with that. But essentially all these actions are to avoid any kind of Senate and House of Representative interaction. It's gotten that jammed up inside of Washington. And when you look at it, the political climate doesn't look, well, there couldn't be a bigger difference between Secretary Clinton, who thinks climate change is real, who thinks it's man-made, thinks we should do something, and has a proposal. Same with Bernie Sanders. Ted Cruz, no, not going to bother with that sort of stuff. Um, Kasich? Ah, maybe. Maybe. You know, the science might still be out, but he thinks we should do something, but he doesn't have a proposal. Rubio? Yep, it's real. I mean, he lives in Miami. Right? I mean, if anybody's going to get hit, it's going to be Miami if there's a sea level rise. So, yeah, it's real, but did we cause it? Well, no, 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 no. And then uh, your friend, Donald Trump, he's not worried about anything except getting that wall built. Right. Well, no comment on that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, here's some of the other candidates that are no longer in the running. Uh, Jeb Bush was sort of the only one that was close, him and Chris Christie, both of them are governors, were governors on the coastline and could see the potential damages. And so what Chris Christie said was, yes, I believe people are doing it, but I don't believe it's a crisis. So that's how he left off the no here and maybe why he's no longer in the race. Right? So that what happens this November is going to be obviously a huge difference in terms of what the U.S. does in terms of climate change policy and what we agree to in this pledge and review. And if, um, if Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders, becomes president, um, we will have a very different view towards fracking than we do now. His view is ban it right now. So hydraulic fracking is a way to extract natural gas or oil. And his position on it is, we're just going to ban it. That's it. Enough of this. This is not helping us. We are not moving in the right direction. He also, I think, wants to get rid of NAFTA, too. That's another story. But he's pretty aggressive in his policies, where Secretary San, uh, Clinton, it's complicated, but that's kind of always her answers. Is it's complicated, you know, it sounds like an economist a little bit, sort of, you know, mm, a little of this, a little of that. Um, the Republican view is they're, they're, they're not happy with uh, the president making an end run around Congress to impose all sorts of rules. 
um, through executive orders and of course these rules are being fought in court about um, whether or not they're valid or not. So again, the, the push on this, whether we're going to take a deliberate economic viewpoint or an urgent economic viewpoint, truly is going to be influenced by whoever prevails next November. And what that means for the global community, incredibly different, um, incredibly different outcomes for our perspective, given we are one of the two main contributors of carbon emissions. So if we think about climate economics now, what we're oftentimes thinking about is a transfer of wealth from the rich of today to the poor, the vulnerable of tomorrow. That's what the economic trade-off comes down to. Us making sacrifices today to potentially help those people who are most committed to running their economies under the climate, usually agriculture, uh, forestry, usually a traditional natural resource base. And in the end, the economist question is always, do the winners win more than the losers lose? And in this case, today's generation making sacrifice, we're the losers in terms of changing our lifestyles. The winners are our children, and children will never meet. Children will, in countries will never even visit. And so that's the big ethical issue for you, is to decide if you can tighten your wallet, tighten your belt, in order to help somebody in a country you may never visit who are going to have children you'll never meet. And it's not an easy question, and it's not a, it's not, something everyone thinks about every day. But in a way, we're asking you to think about it, to step back and decide if you can step back with everybody else. Now, for an economist, it's this question of changing prices versus changing hearts. I'm not here to change your heart. You are who you are. I am who I am. I'm not here to convince you to be a nicer, kinder, gentler person who walks everywhere, right? I'm not trying to convince you to recycle everything and to go back to a, 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 a scrub board to wash your clothes or not. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm, that's not me. That, that's somebody else. That's not an economist, right? Because trying to change hearts, that takes centuries. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a different kind of faith. My job is to change prices so that when you come in and you go, huh, wow, gasoline is more expensive than it used to be. All right, I'm going to ride my bike. So in a way, I haven't changed your heart. I've just changed your choice by changing prices. And so what economists are trying to do is to get the prices right. So if we said do the right thing at the right time, uh, I would argue let's get the prices right, which is, might be the right thing to do. Okay. But I'm going to leave you be. I'm not trying to change you. Right? So don't take it personal if I change prices. Okay? Right? It's not because I don't like you. Because I let you be who you want to be. I just change prices to reflect the true scarcity of our environment relative to our non-environment setting. So who pays? Well, obviously we all do, given this is the biggest coordination game we'll ever see. And I think the big question that is the biggest difference in the, in the fight over all this is who's responsible for the past, the stock of carbon, that's us, the Western world, the developed economies, we're the ones who put it there, we got rich doing it, versus who's responsible for the future, the flow that's coming in, which are going to be the emerging economies, the Russias, the Chinas, the Brazils, the, you know. And so you got this inherent tension about the U.S. going, ah, you know, 
that was then, let's talk about now, right? Versus someone saying, well, yeah, that was then, but, you know, you are responsible for then. When, how much relative to wealth? So, I guess the take-home message that I would like you to think about through all this stuff, and if you put your economist hat on here and step outside the ideologies, is if you think about this like planet insurance, it only makes sense to invest resources to minimize the risk that we're going to be stuck in a bad state that we can't deal with, right? that we cannot adapt to. It only makes it only makes sense. It doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. Doesn't matter your political persuasion. Everyone can agree we don't want to create the chance that we get stuck in a bad state we cannot adapt to. And once you frame it that way, then it makes it easier for everybody to just decide to take a step back. Thank you very much. Y ahora queremos agradecer eh, la presencia del doctor Omar Danilo Hernández, que es eh, doctor en Comunicación Internacional por la Universidad de Texas en Austin, quien va a tener un breve diálogo con Jason Shogren en la espera de sus preguntas. Gracias. Sit down. All right, well, thank you very much for um, your talk and for your presence here in Monterrey. We are uh, in dire need of um, such issues being debated in the public sphere. So again, thank you very much. Um, and I would like to um, start uh, this um, conversation by um, uh, retaking your point about deliberate versus um, urgent um, economics, right? Um, the uh, Cuyahoga River uh, burned in Cleveland uh, in 1969, almost 50 years ago. Um, Frank Schumann uh, had a solar uh, energy power plant running in Egypt in 1912. And, and he even said in the New York Times in 1916, 100 years ago, that uh, um, solar energy was the way to go and that uh, humans could count on it. So we're looking at half a century, a whole century. Um, and so having those two elements put together, what would you say to people that are concerned that, in fact, we don't have that much time, that, that with that time frame for change, 100 years, 50 years, and not much has happened, really, uh, aren't we really facing a tremendous urgency right now in, in terms of beginning to do more about climate change? The easy, straightforward answer is yes, we should be doing something right now. The harder part is convincing everyone when a lot of the potential realized damages are 50 years out. The things like the river starting on fire, right? So in the U.S., in Ohio, when the, when the famous uh, river started on fire, we passed almost all of our environmental laws right around that same time with an, a Republican administration. And it was because we could not avoid it anymore. Uh, when a river starts on fire, clearly something's wrong. And when bald eagles are uh, dying, clearly something's wrong. And we need to pass the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Superfund Act. All happened right in that, that time period under who we would not consider to be an environmental president, President Nixon. Now, today, 
with the, I think they just announced this morning that February was the hottest month on average globally for the last 200 years. Um, if this continued trend is not enough to get people's attention, then I'm not sure what kind of emergency is going to get people's attention. We ran a survey on people's perception of, of the Ebola virus uh, to find out how much they thought about pandemic risks relative to terrorism risks relative to environmental risks, both pre and post the Ebola scare. And even with something as immediate as Ebola, what we saw in the US population was barely any movement in terms of their perception on what the real risk they were facing. And so actually getting people to process this information, to choose to choose to decide that this risk is more real than I can imagine um, is, is something that has baffled people for centuries. Mm -hmm. It truly has. Uh, we've tried it with radon. Eh, people were not too scared of an invisible gas that could give you cancer. Yes. Um, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Um, we tried it with uh, carcinogen gins and food and then uh, we tried it with uh, cigarette smoking where my favorite story is you know in the UK where they had it just said smoking kills on the pack of cigarettes and the little old lady who walked in and said will you give me a brand of smoking kills <laughs> uh, I mean it's funny but it's sad what does it take what risk has a river on fire and bald eagles dying was enough to work in the U.S. in the 70s. What, is, what does it mean now for climate change today to get people to actually say this risk is real? Uh, that's, I, I wish I had the, the silver bullet there. Yes. Uh, what would you say regarding economics itself uh, as a science? What amount of uh, responsibility uh, perhaps could be attached to the rational choice thinking in which we reduce basically the universe to dollars and cents. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm, I'm mm -hmm. in production is here, but but in a way, isn't that a little bit behind this a tremendous difficulty in getting people to to see something else uh, rather than you know my own convenience in dollars and cents? When I started as an economist uh, back in graduate school in the early '80s the profession was dominated by economists who made all the trade-offs in dollar and cents and there was a set of environmental economists who were more like the tail trying to wag the dog and attempting to move economics into a bigger sphere of uh, trying to get them to accept the notion that non-monetary factors play a key role in all this and over my career what I've witnessed is um, environmental economics growing in terms of importance to the point now where nearly all the main major economics departments around the globe have an environmental economist and most of them are now focused on climate change issues. And they could still be focused in on a more narrow perspective of how it affects markets as opposed to non-market commodities. But the transformation in the profession Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I didn't think I would see it that big. But I, are we responsible for, for where we are? Um, I'll take some responsibility for it. Not at all. All right. You, you didn't <laughs> think you'd see Sir Nicholas Stern yes. you know, go this far. Exactly. Um, I have questions um, here, some related questions that I think I'm going to try to package into one. Um, and it has to do with um, um, raising livestock and deforestation uh, to provide, uh, well, the, the, the place in which to raise the livestock. Uh, and, and of course, that brings us to the methane uh, issue, right? Um, what about that? You, you didn't mention that specifically. You focus a lot on uh, emissions from uh, um, internal combustion engines. But the methane problem, 
how big is it and the deforestation associated with it uh, is it part of what we're looking at in terms of the solutions in Paris uh, and and so on is that being considered yeah so, I mean the methane part of it it's more intense in terms of uh, the overall greenhouse gas emissions. So when I'm talking about greenhouse gas emissions, methane is embedded in that group. And obviously, moving to more livestock and deforestation has a double impact of reducing carbon sinks at the same time as producing methane emitters. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, we have to decide what it is we want to eat. And like I said, I'm not trying to tell everybody to be a vegetarian. I'm not trying to change your heart here to be, you know, to everyone switch to uh, being a vegetarian, even though it might be healthier for you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Um, so as long as there's a demand for meat products, there's going to be a demand for deforestation. Now, how does that change? Well, if you decide to put a methane tax on on meat, um, boy, I don't want to be the politician who <laughs> who offers that up as a strategy to get elected. Um, not not in the U.S. Probably not in Mexico. Not in Mexico. Um, maybe in California, but maybe not. Uh, you know, it would be you would be asking a lot, but. <laughs> in terms of actually addressing the potential risks posed by it, that's, that is an option. All right, thank you. Um, here's another question that uh, begins like this. Monterrey is more and more polluted all the time. Um, I don't understand how the world will accomplish its Cancun's protocol gas and Paris now if big cities are getting worse and worse in terms of pollution and people get used to it apparently living with it. Right. Um, yeah, what would you say about this urban mentality? Well, I mean, as a small town guy, um, the urban man mentality, I, I would follow the Santiago example of them realizing they have a challenge, which is air, uh, they're in a valley which has air inversions, which traps the pollution in, which is making people sick, including kids, and they decided to do something about it, and they decided to do something about it cost-effectively by setting up a cap-and-trade system that said, here's the amount of daily pollution or monthly pollution that can be released, and here are permits, handed them out, and then let people buy and sell until they tighten down on what they thought was acceptable levels of air pollution. Uh, doing that in, in Monterey, I don't know if it's feasible, um, but it's an option. Uh, we've done it in the U.S. for the reduction of lead from gasoline. Set up a permit system and then trade it down and shrunk the amount of lead that we could actually do. There's ways to do it to reduce the pain of transitioning from the current situation to another situation. And usually that transition um, doesn't have to be overnight, but it can be a pattern where you actually aim for a target and you find a cost-effective way to hit it. Then it becomes up to everyone in Monterey to decide that's what they want. Right, right. Um, it, the majority. That's right. Um, about um, this uh, deep and a few countries versus, you know, shallow and everybody. Um, the uh, question, this next question that comes from somebody in the um, audience uh, says that, um, ask you, don't you think that uh, these plans would significantly affect the economy and the possibility of development of a lot of countries around the world if, again, you wouldn't have available the path to development that was used by the already developed countries? That's a fair question. Um, the other side of it is whether or not you need to go down that same path or whether you can leapfrog over the old technology and replace it with new technologies. And for developing countries that 
had poor communication systems. They leapfrogged over the old system of landlines, right, to um, wireless and cellular in many places. And the question is whether you can leapfrog over the fossil fuels to uh, be able to use some kind of renewable energy sources. Well, I think, to me, the biggest challenge is coming up with a battery. So if you're an engineer out there and you want to come up with the battery that allows you to store solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and allows you to store it with minimal loss and you can make it cost effective, you will be able to perhaps skip that step. But until that battery comes along, that mm -hmm. is the source and essentially the, the holder of the energy, uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be hard to make that tr transition without using the older technologies. That seems to be, you know, I'm, I'm not a energy engineer, but as I look at all the literature and try to understand where the bottleneck is, to me, that's, that's the key to it all. Okay, well, um, it seems that we have run out of time. Time is implacable. It's just there and it, it cuts us off. Uh, there's a, a significant issue of biodiversity reduction uh, that um, I don't know if you'd like to say a word about that. There's a couple of questions related to that here, uh, how we're really reducing the biodiversity in the planet and it's related to uh, the Anthropocene of, of the, the man-related activities. So we have a one minute uh, then <laughs> yeah one minute way to to resolve biodiversity maybe two <laughs> two maybe uh it it really comes down to in in many my in my mind payment for ecosystem services i mean most uh endangered species in the u.s is found on private land 80 percent 90 percent of endangered species are found on private land and so there's an inherent tension between development and conservation and it really does come down to being able to protect the public good being held in private hands by allowing the people with private hands to have their sweat equity protected, by allowing their stewardship when they think they're good stewards of the land to be recognized, and by having their privacy maintained. And as long as governments can work with people and work with landowners and maintain those three things, I think we've got a better chance. But once you start pushing away one of those three things on private landowners, then we end up with the private landowner revolutions like we see pop up every now in the Western United States and different places around the globe. Um, again, it's an economic solution rather than trying to change hearts that we want to save every living creature. Um, but in my mind, maybe we can change hearts over the next century, but we don't have that much time. So we need to change prices. All right, let's change prices then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.